Herzlich willkommen. Tut uns leid für die kleine Verspätung. Dafür haben wir heute die Besonderheit, dass alle drei Künstler, die in der Ausstellung vertreten sind, auch anwesend sind. Und deshalb wollen wir die Eröffnung der Ausstellung Library of Exile ein wenig anders gestalten. Ich werde eine kurze Einführung geben und dann aber meine Kollegin Leontine Meyer van Mensch auf die Bühne bitten, die Direktorin der ethnografischen Sammlungen in Sachsen, die sozusagen einen Raum dieser Ausstellung vertritt, das Damaskuszimmer, und die drei Künstler, Edmund de Waal, Susanna Schanin und Marc Justiniani. Und äh, wir möchten die Ausstellung mit einer kleinen Podiums, einem kleinen Podiumsgespräch mit diesen drei Künstlern beginnen. Ähm, ja, der Namengebend für unsere Ausstellung war die Rauminstallation von Edmund de Waal, Library of Exile, ähm, die seine beiden großen Leidenschaften miteinander verknüpft, nämlich das Porzellan und die Literatur. Und beides ist ja auch der Geschichte des japanischen Palais eingeschrieben. Sie wissen hoffentlich alle, dass, dass ja ursprünglich die architektonische Hülle für die kurfürstlich-königliche Porzellansammlung war und als die allerdings im, in ihrem Interieur letztlich nie vollendet wurde und ein Traum blieb. Und als das Porzellan gegen Ende des 18. Jahrhunderts in den Keller verbannt wurde, zogen hier außer den antiken Skulpturen und der Münzsammlung auch die kurfürstlich-königliche Bibliothek ein. Und ähm, als dann bereits 1918 aus dieser kurfürstlichen Bibliothek die Sächsische Landesbibliothek hervorging, war das japanische Palais schon ganz dem Buch gewidmet, ein Haus des Buches. Und ja, Aspekte, die in Edmund de Waals Arbeit Library of Exile anklingen, äh, Aspekte des, der Zensur, der Vertreibung, auch der Zerstörung und des Verlusts, sind wiederum auch eng verknüpft mit der Geschichte des japanischen Palais. Hier in der Landesbibliothek lagen die schwarzen Listen aus, nach denen Bücher eingesammelt wurden für die ersten Buchverbrennungen 1933 in Dresden. Und als 1945 ähm, der Bombenangriff über Dresden kam, wurde auch das japanische Palais getroffen und, ähm, und viele Bücher gingen dauerhaft verloren. Und weil es so viele historische, inhaltliche Verbindungen gab, hatten ähm, Marion Ackermann und ich die Idee, Edmond de Waal hierher einzuladen mit seiner Arbeit, von der er uns berichtet hatte und die er ja dieses Jahr zunächst in Venedig gezeigt hat. Und er wird uns sicher selbst besser äh, nachher ausführlicher berichten können, inwiefern dieser neue Ort für seine Arbeit auch einen neuen Kontext dafür eröffnet. Das war also der Nukleus, der Aus Ausgangspunkt für unsere Ausstellung. Ähm, und dann konnten wir Erika Hoffmann für die Idee gewinnen und haben mit ihr gemeinsam ein Werk aus ihrer Sammlung ausgewählt, mit der wir einen weiteren Raum dieses Palais bespielt haben. Und zwar die Arbeit äh, Corner One und Corner Two von Susanna Schanin. Und in dieser Arbeit äh, fragt Susanna Schanin, was wir brauchen, um uns beheimatet zu fühlen. Ähm, was sie definiert, einen Raum, einen persönlichen, privaten Raum, durch hängende ähm, weiße Seidentücher. Und dieser Raum ist schützend, aber zugleich auch durchlässig und beweglich, auch gefährdet dadurch. Und er ist eben auch leicht und kann mitgenommen werden und ist nicht unbedingt an einen Ort gebunden. Und ähm, ja, sie hat uns heute Morgen auch beim Presserundgang erzählt, sie hat diese Arbeit geschaffen, als sie sich selbst ein Zuhause eingerichtet hat und darüber nachgedacht hat, ob das jetzt ihr Zufluchtsort ist und wie beständig der sein kann. Und es ergibt sich auch aus ihrer persönlichen Familiengeschichte, dass sie vorsichtig damit ist, sich zu sicher in seinen eigenen vier Wänden zu fühlen, versteht sich aber auch als eine Nomadin. Und dann der nächste Raum, den wir betreten, ähm, äh, enthält die Arbeit von Marc Justiniani, die er schon 2018 für die Kinderbiennale geschaffen hat und die sehr beliebt war bei unseren Besuchern. Und auch er fragt danach, was bleibt oder was wir mitnehmen, aber auch was fehlt und was an dessen Stelle tritt. Und in The Well, also dem Brunnen, ähm, eröffnet sich ein Blick in eine scheinbar unendliche Tiefe durch Spiegelung und vorbei an Überbleibseln, an Resten, an Objekten, die ein Leben geformt haben. Und in der Mitte dieser Arbeit steht eine Säule aus Büchern, die Marc als Fragmente verschiedener Leben begriffen hat. 
ähm, oder beschrieben hat. Und ich habe daraus geschlossen, dass ja Bücher auch als ähm, ja, Speicher einer persönlichen Geschichte, als etwas begreift, was auch fortlebt und neue Formen annimmt. Genau, und von dort können wir dann nach oben gehen in, äh, in das Damaskuszimmer, das Leontine Meyer von Mensch unbedingt öffnen wollte, obwohl es noch, nicht, noch immer nicht ganz fertig restauriert ist, sodass es eine Restaurierungswerkstatt ist. Ähm, und das Damaskuszimmer ist ja selbst ein Raum, der hier sozusagen in der Diaspora ist, auch wenn, auch wenn er nicht gezwungenermaßen nach äh, Deutschland kam, ist er hier doch in einem neuen kulturellen Teu Zeu äh, Kontext und traurigerweise ja auch ein Zeugnis einer Kultur, die auch sehr stark von Zerstörung und Verlust betroffen war. Und er kann aber auch Akteur werden in diesem neuen Kontext, kann, ähm, bietet die Chance auch über eben kulturelle, sprachliche Grenzen hinweg äh, eine Verbindung herzustellen. Und das versuchen wir auch in dieser Ausstellung zu tun, indem wir zum Beispiel zu ähm, dialogischen Rundgängen in arabischer und deutscher Sprache einladen, die auch ähm, begleitet werden von syrischstämmigen Dresdnern und Dresdnerinnen. Aber ich denke, an dieser Stelle übergebe ich doch gerne das Wort an Leontine und bitte unsere Künstler auf die Bühne. When were you first here? When was the first time you visited this, this, this magical space, but also contested space? I first came here about 10, 12 years ago Ooh. with Martin Roth, my friend. And I was absolutely gripped by it. I mean, for me, this was a place of pilgrimage. As you know, this is the great center of the world for porcelain. I mean, this is the palace that was built by Augustus as his great theater of porcelain, his great performative space where you would walk through one incredible room after another and be transported, be here in Dresden, but also be in Japan, be in China, be everywhere in the world. Maybe a portal It's, to the world? Yes, an in his own control, of course, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's Augustus the Strong. But, but, you know, here I was in this extraordinary fantasy of, of, of a building, which was both here in Dresden and also somewhere else, also elsewhere. And the thing that gripped me, absolutely gripped me, were these rooms that, that showed the scars of the war, of the bombing, that they hadn't been restored. They hadn't been brought back into Dresden bling, if, like, I, can, if, I, can, if I can use such a phrase. You mean um, at the other side of the river? They're the wrong side of the river, you know. I, um, I'm a South Londoner, so this means a lot to me. They're the south of the... Um, 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 and, and so what was absolutely compelling for me is that I understood these spaces um, as being more... having a, a more real, powerful, visceral, bodily connection to, to what I care about, which is how you hold history in all its complexity, it's all its unresolved stories, uh, how you show that um, um, and, and work with it, rather than erase it, paint over it, um, um, restore it. So that was my first encounter. And then I came back and back, and then I had this extraordinary encounter. I was writing a book about Porcelain, The White Road. It's a kind of autobiography, and I... A beautiful I, book. Thank you. And... Um, available from all good German bookshops. Um, and and, and, um, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd been told this marvelous story that, 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 that in, in Syria, in Damascus, in all the how, great houses in Damascus, there were Chinese, it was Chinese porcelain, beautiful Chinese porcelain in these houses. And it was just the beginning of the Civil War, and I couldn't get to Damascus. And I came here, and I went up to the Damascus room, And I sat drinking tea in the Damascus room with Anka. Anka is here. Where are you, Anka? Ah. With the wonderful Anka, who spent 20 years restoring this room. Um. <laughs> and, 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 and it was extraordinary, because it, it's an exiled space. It's a powerful, 
a powerful exiled space here in, in Dresden, and I write in the book about having tea with you, <laughs> delicious tea, and, and, and saying that I couldn't get to Damascus, but Damascus had come to me. And so this whole series of stories of being in different places simultaneously seemed to me what this place is about enough. You were here last year, right? Yes. Uh, because your work was, um, I would say, uh, a wonderful piece, a very strong piece in the in the children's biennale. How was it? How was it for you, your first encounter with this this space, and how is it to be back? <laughs> well, before we went to the space, one thing that we've noticed is that it's very quiet because I come from Manila, and Manila is very chaotic, and. Here we hear our footsteps. So even, even in the streets we hear our footsteps. And that's kind of odd for me. And then when we, uh, when we saw the building, uh, the crates were there, the crates for the well, the, the, the piece that I have here. And it was about to be um, placed inside and it passed through the courtyard and I, then I saw the sculptures. Uh, the sculptures in the columns that are carrying, and I found it a bit odd um, because the proportions, the, what they were wearing was kind of familiar, but the, the proportions were still the bulk you know, uh, and the, the weight of it. Um, it's like a combination of what it wants to portray and what is embedded here. So th there's that, that mixture. And I was thinking, how, how would my work uh, relate to the space? And then when, I, uh, when, when we were exploring the whole place, and then we saw a lot of reconstructions, and the idea of reconstruction and loss and absences, uh, which is very present in my work, and I think that connects also the, the trying to retrieve something that is no longer there, but uh, we want to acknowledge that it's not there, but, but we also want to uh, connect what's remaining uh, to, to what is uh, the past. You know. So uh, with my piece, uh, I've gathered objects that were used by so many different people, but it's presented in a way that there's a lot of present absences. You know? There's a lot of, there's, there's a presence of a wholeness there, but actually, because most of it is just light and it's not real matter, uh, presenting wholeness with like less than 10% matter is, yeah. <laughs> this morning, when we had our walk through um, um, the exhibition spaces, um, you also contextualized the work very strongly with your own biographical context, which mm -hmm. I found very strong and moving, yeah. and it also gave me an extra layer in, in inter interpreting your work, although I, I saw your work at the Children's Biennale and I fell in love with it, but it okay. was a layer that I had not seen yet before. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you maybe okay. talk a bit about, about also the Filipino um, recent history that unfortunately most of us um, are not so familiar with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was born in 1966 and uh, former President Marcos was about to be in power at that, that year and then he declared martial law in 1972, so I was Six years, six years old then, and he was in power for 20 years. So uh, there was a revolution uh, in 1986, a people power revolution. It was a peaceful revolution where millions of people went to the, to the streets, and, and I was there, and we were there, and we were 20 years old, and Marcos was 20 years in power. So it felt that that revolution was ours. It was for our generation. 
and when the succeeding uh, administrations uh, replaced uh, Marcos, it seemed that the same things were just happening, or a lot of the same things were, were happening that got us disillusioned. And I was thinking about the role of art in society and what role can it play in a place like the Philippines. Uh, it seems like a luxury. So uh, I got involved in propaganda work and uh, activist groups. And uh, when you're young, you do such things. Um, and uh, we did murals, uh, collaborative murals for street rallies. We would do paintings on the streets and, and did t-shirts, comics, um, propaganda material uh, against the government. And somehow that also uh, is shown in the artworks when, when I was a painter, because I was a figurative painter for about for more than 20 years. Um, it still shows a little bit, but it's no longer as foregrounded. But I, I think that the, the weight of the work shows a kind of, even though sometimes it's flighty, but there's, there's a kind of uh, pain and hardship there. You know, there's a lot of wounds also present in the work. So. I mean, I don't want to do too much interpretation. I think also work can speak for itself. But there are these three different works of art, and there's this Damascus room, and I think this is one sort of red thread combining all the, the three works. Um, you were taking pictures this morning as well of all these um, statues right here in the, in the palace. How is it for you to be to be here and to have your piece of art here in, in, in Dresden and more specifically in, in the Japanese Paris palace with these two guys? Fantastic. <laughs> um, well, um, uh, answering this question very particularly, I think my, mm, I'm very happy about how my work fit to the building. It's kind of memory of building or several buildings in this building. And um, mm, I was in Dresden several, several times, but the last time I was here, um, um, for the Erika birthday, and I learned Erika Hoffman, who collected this work of mine 14 years ago. We installed it in Berlin together, and I learned that um, the collection comes to Dresden, which was a fantastic, great news and yeah did, did it feel make, good make there, there is a sort of peep in the i don't know if you hear it as well it's a bit annoying isn't it <laughs> the guy in the back please ah, he's working on it i'm sorry um maybe it's it's it should be here and and i learned that the collection is here and um it's for me very private news means also that my work become a citizen of Dresden and this is this is something so I am very happy f that for the first time this work is shown here and, um, and um, it's very particular if remembering that I'm coming from Warsaw uh, Poland and the city uh, which uh, has a certain very painful and very rich history. And um, my work was done because of the memory and because of my life growing up in the house which was bombed during the Second War. So this kind of memory coming to, from Warsaw to Dresden as a, as a parallel or not symmetrical, but similar history is very important for me. It's particularly important for me 
and I, I think it's just the place to be. So, uh, so that's that's my feelings for today. Um, um, yes. Uh, could could you tell us a bit more about your work um, and also? the thoughts you have on how this work, because it's, it's, it's a work that you already have been creating um, a few years ago, how, how the meaning of the work, the layeredness of the work, the connotation of the work changes in, in the course of time. Um, this work uh, was done in a process. First, I. I've done in uh, 1995 the first corner, and this corner was shown uh, first in the uh, Foxal Gallery. Then I make it a little bit bigger, and it started to travel to um, with the exhibition to um, Center of Contemporary Art in Chicago and to other places. Uh, in the United States, and it uh, came to, then it went to Los Angeles, and then came back to Berlin, and by this time I already have done the second corner, and when, uh, when uh, Erika decided to take it, it was already two corners put together, and if you put two corners together, it becomes a space. And this space, if you would go to the exhibition, you will see that the corners, they are not closed. They are built from the walls. But this is very important, the direction of the walls. If you put walls in one line and direction like that, it divides people. <coughs> it's something which doesn't connect. But if you close it, you start to make corners. You put corners to corners together, it becomes a shelter. So, my work could be a, a wall, but it's, it would never be a wall. It would be always a shelter. And it happens... A, a safe with space the, also? A safe space? It is a, a space which has a memory or wish and dream about to be safe, but at the same mm. time conscious about that the safe Life is very fragile. You could be finished in one moment. You can lose everything. You can lose house by war, but you can lose a family not moving from your house. And uh, you can lose things or people. So, safeness, to be conscious about safeness is a very fragile and delicate mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So this is the work about this work about. Um, the technician is standing there giving me signs that maybe your microphone needs to be changed. Um, well, it, it, I was very touched by your um, by your, your 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 vulnerability and safeness because it also, of course, reflects to the, the this Damascus timber. Um, which is now, which is coming from a country where since 2011 um, a civil war or uh, where there is war and, and there's no space safe, uh, space, yeah, safe space left. Yeah, you have to think that uh, not Damascus but Aleppo looked now like Warsaw in '44 and like Dresden that time. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the same history and the same situation. Yeah. Edmund, um, your work has been traveling uh, and it changed, no, as you said, in, in meaning. We did not talk about it, but I can imagine your work as well. What you're, what you're showing here, the Library of Exile, and, and, and friends of us uh, are here from, from Venice. I'm so happy that you're here. And then afterwards, this is also going to, to, to London. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you why, why? Yeah. and um, what? Okay, why and what? Um. How much time do we have? <laughs> 
Um, why and what? I mean, in, in, in a very real sense, of course, um, a library is already migratory. It's full of books that have come from somewhere else. It's full of stories and voices that have already moved. So the idea of a library of exile, which is au fond in itself a way of thinking about the migratory nature of language, how all those generations, hundreds of generations of people who have been forced across borders with only their language with them and have taken and recreated literature and then had it translated so that you have this flow, this extraordinary flow between cultures of language and literature. Then you make a library, which is also migratory, and you start that library off somewhere. You start that library off. We started it in Venice. Um, we started it in Venice during the Biennale, and, and, and in Venice it was very extraordinary. It was a very powerful place to start it because Venice, of course, is the great um, center of the world for translation and, and for publishing and in, during the whole of the Renaissance. It's the center of the world. And it had a very particular feeling there in Venice. Um, and in fact, you'll see it downstairs when, after you've had your drink. Uh, there are four installations in the, in, in the library, which, each of which is based around a particular page of the Talmud, which was printed in Venice. So that's Venice. That's where it begins. But then it needs to travel. So it comes to Dresden. Why does it come to Dresden? It comes to Dresden because... Because this is also, this particular place is a place of the printing and destruction of books. I mean, Dresden is, of course, the first place where there's the first book burning in Germany in 1933. That's part of this history. It's also the place where all those great libraries were destroyed in 1945. It's also a place on lots of different borders. It's always always, always had this contingency, this vulnerability about being the center of an empire, but also being on lots of borders. So it's an extraordinarily difficult and complex place to bring it. And also the politics now. You know, you want to talk about activism. You want to talk about why you do something in the world. It comes here to Dresden for a reason. And then it's a traveling library. It goes from here in the spring. It goes to the British Museum again to a, to a particular place in the British Museum, which was bombed. And then from London, it's, the whole library has been given to Mosul, um, where it becomes the foundation of the new university library um, in Mosul, which was destroyed by ISIS. So when you... Talking you're, about activism, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this library does two things you're not supposed to do in a library, okay? One, you're never supposed to talk in a library. You have to talk in this library. You have to talk. You have to talk in this library. You're never supposed to write in a book, ever. You are asked to find a book in the library, open it up, a book that matters to you, that talks to you about, about where you come from, your family, what you care about. You open it up, and it says Ex Libris, Library of Excel, and you add your name. So you write in the book. So already, 20,000, 25,000 people came to see it in, in Venice. By the time it finishes here, uh, there will be thousands more will have written their names in books, and they go on to London, and they go on to Mosul. And so what we're doing is talking about the absolute, basic, powerful, complicated, poetic fact, which is that language moves with people. I was, I, I was there was a really good question coming up, wasn't there? <laughs> I can feel the question building here. Don't make me nervous. <laughs> you run this place. You can't be nervous. I'm the visitor. <laughs> no, what I, what I wanted to ask you, whether the Heine quote... Yeah. If you could elaborate a bit more on the Heine quote and, um, yeah. in relation to the space that we are now yeah. So, so when, you, when you go downstairs you, and you walk round the outside of the library and, and you pick up a leaflet because it has the text written in German and English, 
It's, it's a list of all the destroyed libraries of the world, from Aleppo, Alexandria, Cordoba, all the madrasa libraries, rabbinical libraries, all the way through to Dresden, to the 21st century, to Sarajevo, all the way through. And up high, it has that terrible, powerful Heine Heine quote, where books are burnt, then people will be burnt. Can you do it in, in German for me? Dort, wo man Bücher verbrennt, verbrennt. Thank God for educated, educated audience, you already know it. But it, 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 it's that extraordinary, extraordinary truth that you begin, you begin by trying to erase someone's literature. You begin by burning their book because you're in power, because of religion, because you don't like the color of their skin, because they offend you in some kind of way. And so you burn their books or you burn their library. And, and, and once, you've, once you've gone down that path of taking a book and putting it on the fire, the next thing to do is you take away their citizenship, you take away their country, you take away their right to be there, you take away their language, you try and, and incrementally destroy them. So, so, so it's, 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 it is, it is the... It is, it, he, Heine wrote it 200 years ago, and it's still an absolute truth the, 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 about, about how, how power works. Unfortunately. 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 So, so why here? Because this is a place which has had a history of book burning, but it's also a place that had suffered appallingly, appallingly in its own turn. And so what I try and do is to say, is to say that you have to look again and again and again uh, at these moments, these moments of the destruction of, 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 of language and the destruction of people and, and bring those two things together. And, and then the complicated thing is that you don't, it's not about memorializing it. It's not about making some great, enormous, big bit of public art in bronze, which, ta -da. Uh, with, ta -da, exactly, which costs a lot of money and you go, it, it's nothing to do with that. It's about getting, it's about beginning again to talk. Children in places migrants, refugees in spaces. It's about ownership of, 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 of a public space, making it a public space private and a private space public, which is, I know, entirely what you're trying to do here in the Yapanisha Palais. Libraries are personal and they're public. They are really interesting, powerful, Enough, 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 well, enough, well, enough. The, the, it's true though, it's, it's true. It, no, I true. absolutely it's true. agree. It's true. Woo! Yeah. This whole concept of the third space, that the first space is our, our home, the second space is our work, and this third space where we come together, where we can get into a dialogue um, to, to, to also to sort of position ourselves in, in, in a sort of civil society, is something that we are now thinking more and more of in, in the context of museums and libraries are already been doing it for years. Yeah. So it's definitely something that we need to, as museum people, need to get inspired by, in li by libraries and, and what the library, the public library do, is doing here in Dresden is marvelous. Yeah. It's so inspiring. Um, you are not here only represented with the library, you're also here represented with uh, the Meissen. I mean, we're all, we are in Dresden, right? I mean, so, could you, could yeah, you say so, something about that? So, so, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in 1938, an incredible Dresden family, the, the Klemperer family, Dresden family with the greatest private collection of Meissen, in Germany had their house looted, all their assets taken away from them, and they were forced into exile. And that Klemperer collection of Meissen was, was looted and owned and scattered around the city and in different collections. And in 1945, some of it was in the city during the bombing, and, and, and some of it was broken and discovered as fragments, as shards, as broken bits of porcelain. Which is also uh, a, a striking broken, image, Broken right? yeah, bits yeah, of porcelain. Yeah, yeah. And they were restituted to the family. And in 2010, 
I bought 18 broken pieces of Meissen porcelain, beautiful plates, 1765, birds, insects, just lyrical, beautiful. And I bought these plates because I wanted this Jewish family's broken plates to... I wanted them in my own family. And then I worked with an incredible artist who's here tonight, Maiko, who will stand up now, please. Um, 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 who is an artist of huge sensitivity to, to work with these plates. And, 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 and Maiko has worked with kintsugi, and kintsugi is the Japanese technique, and it's not about mending things. Okay, it's not about restoration. It's not about making things all right. It's about showing, showing lines of fracture, showing losses. And so when you see the plates downstairs, you'll see what Maiko has done with Kintsugi, which is to, it, which is to hold these plates with great sensitivity, and you'll see lacquer and gold alongside the brokenness. So it's a way of, it's a way of holding holding history together. And so these Meissen plates made here, owned by this Jewish family, looted, rested, found, restituted, bought, worked with, are now back in, back in, 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 in Dresden. And if you want a story about diaspora, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful... It's a, it's a beautiful concept, yeah. uh, um, and and I feel again that it links very much to 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 this open um, conservation space that we now have with with the Damascus yeah. Zimmer. So also here there is this layer and this inter um, yeah linkage with with all the works. Um, how was it to see each other's works here this this morning? Um, and and could you could you maybe um, say something about that? Because that's something that we as as public as visitors rally here. How it is for you as artists to to see each other work each each other's works to get inspired by it, maybe to get annoyed by uh, <laughs> by this one sitting next to me. <laughs> Could you say um, something about that? I first saw the works in YouTube, <laughs> in the internet, and then, oh, wow, uh, um, very. Sometimes I, I have this feeling about if if there's an issue of authenticity, and knowing that I also play with the idea of authenticity and knowing that the works are copies, my, my works are copies, whereas I feel sometimes uh, other people's works are more authentic, not to say that uh, mine would be inferior because they're not authentic. Um, I've, I've talked about it this morning, the importance of copies, the importance of, of replicating things or retelling things visually, for example. Uh, I've just realized maybe about a month ago, because I, we had a show in Venice, right, in the Philippine Pavilion, there's one segment there, that one of the smallest segments uh, in my piece, there's, a, there's an image of a, an object of a small rocking chair with a prison bar, and that is about my grandfather. My, my grandfather and my grand mother, they, were, uh, they, they, they experienced the war in, in the 1940s, and we were, we were under U.S. rule since the early 1900s, and that's why we got dragged into the, the war against the Japanese, and they became guerrillas. Uh, and they would tell us stories that we would huddle around, around our grandparents, and and they'd be sitting in the rocking chair, they'd tell stories about the war, and they would say that it's a life that they did not want to live again. But every time we meet, they'd retell the story over and over and over again, so they relive it every time you meet. And, and it's like 
a, a playback, and, but it also helped them survive. And I'm interested in, in that, in the, the telling of stories, because now we're so, uh, we're looking at screens most of the time. The younger generation would be looking at screens and we don't tell stories anymore. Um, my, my grandfather, when he died, my, my father was uh, looking through his cabinets and inside those cabinets were also written accounts of the same stories. But we didn't know that they, they, he kept them. He kept all of them. That's, so, that's a beautiful and powerful story yeah. that you're sharing yeah. with us this evening. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank and you. Again, yeah. it's, it's also something that connects your, your work, isn't it? Also yours. Um, yes, I, I can I see that my work, uh, comparing these two works of Mark and uh, Edmund, is a work which is um, uh, very empty. It's very empty, uh, which gives other people possibility to tell their own story and remember their own story. It, this work belongs to my series of works, which I called covers. And it's not only a cover for air, this emptiness, but it's also a cover for the, for the memory. And uh, I always say that uh, memory is a factor of future. It's not a factor of past. If I now make this sculpture, it's because of the memory I bring to the future about my mother, grandmother, grandfathers. And um, it is also a work um, which, um, which is a cover for the, my own memory, if I can tell you um, a little bit, because I grew up in the... In, I will tell you a story about the house in Warsaw. I grew up in the house which was built in the early 20s in Warsaw, uh, just two years after Poland got independence uh, from the being uh, provincial of uh, Tsar uh, Russia. And after the revolution, we got uh, independence in 1918. And uh, Warsaw became back, back uh, the capital of the country. And it was very important, and it was this idea to make a new capital of the new country. So the modernism architecture, the modern architecture was very popular and very good at that time. And the house I grew up belonged to the colony, which was a sample of the most beautiful modernism. But in, in between 13 and 15 of um, September 1944, it was bombed. I actually have uh, photographs of the house still standing in the beginning of September and just holes uh, in the place when it was standing. So we lost some part of the family, but also family lost the house. And a and few weeks later, my grandmother and my mother was uh, taken to the... Uh, was taken from home in Warsaw to to the train to Auschwitz, and um, they were they survived during the the trip. The partisan in the forest south of Warsaw uh, stopped the train, and my little mother, who was maybe six years old. And my grandmother, who was actually from German family, her name was Eggersdorf, and she was Polish German, German Polish um, person. They both survived in the forest, and this story, as you said, was so often re repeated in my house. Every, every. Um, time at the table, my mother fed us with the onion because she, as a child, she was 
children who were so, uh, so, uh, res rescued from this train got a uh, got an uh, onion in the forest. There was not, no, nothing to eat, there was no food, there was only some onions. So adults didn't get anything, um, and anything but children, just onions. So my mother fed me with onion always. Susanna, onion is saving your life. <laughs> so. Wow. Actually, I make a sculpture of my mother. I never make. I, I, I recently am try, I'm struggling with the figurative sculpture, which is very complicated after the these experiences and le, uh, year, years of of modernism, abstraction, constructivism, uh, um, conceptual art. So coming back to or trying to make a good contemporary. Figurative uh, sculpture is very difficult, but I started with the with the sculpture of my mother. I tried to sculpt her as a little girl, which is very difficult. It's a little girl with a very very serious face, and always when I exhibit this sculpture, I put a, a fresh onion next to it. Mm. And uh, in some exhibition, this onion put this you know green thing. And it's growing, you know, this onion. My mother died 10 years ago, but the memory of this story is really deep in, my, in, my, uh, in, in me. I cannot say in anything on mine, in me. And, um, and uh, following this uh, corners, uh, corners uh, sculpture, so I was thinking about my house doing this sculpture, but in a different way. At that time, in the mid-90s, we were not talking about the war. It was just the end of the socialism time here also. And um, we, we were, there was a time when we were thinking only about hope. Now it's a lot of fear. But at that time, there was only hope. And, and uh, when I was doing these uh, corners, it was memory of the childhood, of the corners are uh, mysterious, secret places, but also dangerous maybe when it's dark, when you go to sleep, corner is always something which might have be somebody there, or some ghost or something like this. So uh, these corners in the beginning was the memory of my childhood, but today I have to say that I was living with the survivors from the Auschwitz, from the war, and I am a child of survivors. We all child of survivors, you know that. Because it could be that soldiers of war was going through our grandmothers and fathers houses and we could be not here. But I am, I, am, I am here together with you, everybody, because we are all survivors in Europe. And we don't want wars, yeah? That because we don't want wars anymore. And... Um, Thank you. <laughs> Talking about a political stand, um, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I want to give I want to give the floor to you because um, I think you want to I'm, I'm, express I'm, something. I'm, I'm, I'm the only thing standing between you and a glass of wine. <laughs> so, what, one minute, which is just thinking about your work, thinking about the invitation here, thinking all day about the whiteness of your work, the memory of this, the Damascus room, this experience of being in Dresden. And it, I just, a very short poem, read, I'm afraid, in English by Celan, Paul Celan, Homecoming, which is entirely, entirely about exile. Snowfall, denser and denser, dark colored as yesterday, snowfall as even now you were sleeping, white stacked into distance, above it endless, the sleigh track of the lost, Below, hidden, presses up what so hurts the eyes, hill upon hill, invisible. On each, fetched home into its today, and I slipped away into dumbness, wooden, a post, 
There a feeling, blown across by the ice wind, attaching its dove, its snow, colored cloth as a flag. Homecoming, here, now, wine. <laughs> This is so beautiful. I, 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 I'm glad that we are doing this together. Um, and it's an honor sitting on stage with, with the three of you. You're, you're, you're pretty cool, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, one minute, one minute, Edmund. Because <laughs> you get your wine, don't worry. Um, because you're not only cool, a lot of very cool people worked, worked on this um, exhibition and, and, and the, the whole programming. And I would like to acknowledge them. And I think you're, you're okay with that, right? Good. Good. Um, I would like to thank Erika Hoffman. Um, for, for curating this with us, for her wisdom, her wit. Um, and it's, 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 you're a marvelous person and it's an honor that we got to know you. Um, a special, special Thanks to Noura Dirani. <laughs> who I would say is the embodiment of the Japanese palace and who lives and, and thinks in this transdisciplinary way. And it's very inspiring uh, working together with you. Um, and you are not here that long yet, but you seem to revitalize the Japanese spellers with what you're doing and getting all those different stakeholders and a beautiful ecological cafe here and yoga and it's, it's wonderful what you're doing. A big applause. <laughs> I'm a fan and Nura is the future of the SK Day, definitely. Um, I would like to thank Claudia Schmidt and Margarete Bijfank uh, for uh, the excellent um, educational program. You, and you find all the details in, 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 the, in, in this wonderful, um, wonderful accompanying brochure. We have tandem exhibitions, we have cooking together, we have um, reading. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful program. So girls, thank you. I would, I would like to, 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 to thank uh, the dialogical tandem team who will do in pairs uh, tours in Arabic and, 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 and German. And it's uh, uh, talking about what we're just, um, well, it, it, it's so important especially here, and especially now. And I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and last but not least, I would like um, to thank our various cooperation partners um, in the city. And, and this space wants to open up to different uh, stakeholders. Uh, with their own dynamism, and for me being the new kid on the block in the in the SK day, it's it's very inspiring. Um, the municipal library, thank you so much. The theater um, of the young generations, um, wonderful. Thank you for cooperating. I also need to thank the Gerda Henkel Foundation and the Resounds Foundation and the Marina and Sylvia Arnold um, who provided three walls or the, the funds for, for, uh, uh, for, for restoring the three walls and the ceiling um, of, the, um, of, of, the, um, of, the, of the Damascus room. Um, and in this final stage, and I'm so grateful that the Ernst von Siemens uh, Foundation 
um, is willing to, to, to complete or play a huge role in, in completing um, the, the, the restoring of the Damascus Simmer and hopefully we will all see each other July 2020 and then the Damascus Simmer is, um, is complete again. And thank you so much for making that possible. Um, woo! <laughs> And um, I would like to thank um, Hagen Friede, uh, my wonderful colleague who did a lot here in, in making it all uh, possible. Uh, my wonderful colleague Stephanie Bach, who, who rocked um, um, this exhibition. Angelika Hofmeister, Anka Scharas, who is already mentioned. Thank you so much. And I don't know if you're here, but the wonderful design um, um, Connecting all the rooms is made by a wonderful uh, design team from Leipzig. Funkelbachs, I don't know if you're here, but you rock. Thank you so much.